Resourceful Designer, Episode 60, Building the Perfect Design Portfolio. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, he wears an American size 10 and a half shoe, Mark Decote. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so happy that you've been able to join me today. Man, I've got to tell you, I've been having a lot of problems with my computer these last past few weeks. I haven't had a chance to sit down and figure out what it is, but I've got applications that are just freezing on me. They're just hanging up. Uh, and it, to the point where there's not much I can do, even if I force quit the application and I try to open it up again, it won't. And I have to restart my computer, but I can't even restart my Mac. When I go to restart it, it just sits there and hangs. So I've got to force it to power off by holding the power button and then rebooting it. And what a pain. I've tried a, a few minor things. I've got some some software that'll help diagnose and repair some permissions and get rid of corrupt preferences and that sort of stuff. And I thought I had fixed it, but no, it's just coming back. And man, what a pain. I can't wait till Apple announces their next computer. I've got the money put aside for a new iMac. That's what I'm waiting for is for them to announce the new iMac because the, the most recent version of the iMac came out in 2015 and we're now 2017. So I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that at the next big Apple announcement in a couple of months, they're going to announce a brand new iMac, in which case I'm going to jump on it and replace this one because I'm using a 2010 model iMac right now. And uh, don't get me wrong, I've got my more than my money's worth out of this thing, but I think I'm due for a new one. But enough about my woes. Now, I got to tell you, it's kind of funny. I got the topic for this week's episode, building the perfect design portfolio. I thought about this a couple of weeks ago, and I've been working up what I wanted to talk about. And then just a few days ago, Jason in the Facebook group asked a question specifically on this topic. So it was kind of coincidence. And I told Jason, I said, hey, if you hold off just a couple of days, you'll be able to hear my podcast about this exact topic. Because he was asking what sort of stuff. He said he's new. He doesn't have a lot of work, specifically client work. And he was asking, what should he put in his portfolio? So I told him, hold off and you'll be able to hear it. So that's just another fun topic that's being discussed in the Facebook group. If you want to join the group, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash group and just ask to join the Facebook group. There's a lot of great conversations going on in there. What a great bunch of people. And now I'm happy to announce that this episode of Resourceful Designer has a sponsor. Yes, that's right. And that sponsor is Design Cuts. And you can check them out by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash design cuts. Now, I have to tell you, I was thrilled when Design Cuts inquired about partnering with me. You see, just like the resources that I share with you every week, and how I tell you that I'll only share resources that I'm familiar with and that I can honestly recommend, well, the same goes for sponsors. And I would not accept a sponsor on this podcast if I didn't believe and have faith in them. And that's why I'm happy to team up with Design Cuts for this episode. Because not only are they a great company with amazing resources for graphic designers, but I'm happy to say that I've been a client of theirs for several years now. In fact, I've purchased numerous of their deal bundles. The last one being the complete font lovers library that I bought just a few weeks ago. And I've already used two of my newly acquired fonts on client projects. So I absolutely love design cuts. Now, I will be honest with you. I've always known design cuts as the go-to place for amazing bundle deals. But I only found out recently that they offer a whole design marketplace where you can purchase individual resources. In fact, Design Cuts is the most curated quality design marketplace in the world. And unlike some other places that might have some good content along with what I like to call below average filler content, Design Cuts only offers the best products from some of the best designers in the world. And you can get these resources cheaper than anywhere else. You see, Design Cuts has a special build your own bundle option where you can save up to 50% off your order with the more items you buy. So whether you're already familiar with Design Cuts or they're completely new to you, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash design cuts to check out their design marketplace as well as their current deal bundle. And don't forget to use my special URL so that Design Cuts will know that you heard about them on this podcast. So once again, that's resourcefuldesigner.com slash design cuts. And now, our resource of the week. And this week, I'm actually changing things up a bit. Instead of a resource, I'm going to give you a little 
tip or tips and tricks section. And I'm thinking of doing this from time to time because in all honesty, after 60 episodes, it's a little bit hard to find new resources to share with you. Stuff that, again, I believe in, that I use, and I'm starting to run out. So I might throw in every once in a while a tip or a trick that might help you with your business. Now, in this week, what I want to talk about is the advanced search functions in Google and how I use them from time to time whenever I need something specific. Have you ever worked on a client job where you have, maybe you're doing a poster for a local event and that local event is being sponsored by a bunch of people and they say, well, all the sponsors, maybe there's a dozen of them or more and they need all their logos on the poster. And of course you say, well, send me the logos and they send you some, some GIF files. They send you low res JPEG files, stuff that's horrible for printing. Well, yes, you can go after them and say, well, I need a a high quality version of your, your logo, specifically a vector format. And some people just look at you with a blank stare. They have no idea what that means. So I want to give you a little trick that I use in order to get good quality logos from some clients. This doesn't always work, but I can tell you that I have used this so many times that it has saved me so much headaches and time and back and forth with the clients trying to figure out how to get the logos. And simply what you do is you figure out, say you need, I'll use a a company like Pepsi as an example. Now, Pepsi, it should be pretty easy to get a hot copy of a good copy of their logo, but let's just say you needed a good vector copy of the Pepsi logo. What you do in Google is you can either go to the advanced search options and you can specify the site. So say you're going to only search pepsi.com and then there's another uh, option, which is file type. And you say you only want to search PDF files and then you hit enter. And what that'll do is it'll bring up results that only display PDF files that are on the website you search. So in this example, pepsi.com. And then what you can do is you open up those PDFs and you find one that has a good copy of the logo. Now, chances are Pepsi is going to have a lot of different PDFs and on one of them, at least they're going to have their logo and chances are it's in vector format. Once you download that PDF, you can then open it up in a program like Illustrator and extract that vector logo from it. Now, if you want to do this even quicker, the way to do it is whenever you go to a Google search, instead of going on the advanced search, all you have to do is in the search bar, type site with a colon, and then the name of the site. So site colon pepsi.com, no spaces. Then you leave a space and you type file type, all one word, colon PDF. Again, no spaces, file type colon PDF. And you hit enter and the same search results will come up. So that's a real quick way to search online. And I have to tell you, I've used this so many times in order to find stuff. Actually, just this past week, I was doing a job for the government of Ontario and the Ontario logo that I had or I was provided wasn't a very good quality one. So I went to Google and in the search bar typed in site colon and then the Ontario's website. And then I put file type colon PDF. I got a bunch of PDFs. I looked through them, quickly found one that had the logo I wanted, downloaded it, opened it up in Illustrator and voila, I had the logo I needed and I didn't have to go hunting. I didn't have to go requesting it from anybody. So that's my tip this week. Use the site colon in order to search specific sites in Google and the file type PDF to bring up PDFs where you can then extract the logos or the vector files that you need. So that's this week's tip of the week. And now building the perfect design portfolio. First off, I want to discuss what exactly is a design portfolio. I mean, if you want to get super technical, A design portfolio is simply a flat case, preferably made of leather, that is used for carrying drawings, artwork, photography, or anything else that has to do with design. That's what a portfolio is. Now, at some point in history, the paper contents of these flat cases took on the verbiage, the title of the container, and they too became known as an artist's portfolio. Nowadays, with the advent of online galleries and such, A design portfolio is simply a collection or a sampling of an artist's work, regardless of the means or medium used to present them. So that's what a portfolio is. Now, what is the purpose of a design portfolio? Well, if you take it down to its most fundamental level, a design portfolio is simply a way to say, hey, look at me. See how great I am. You should hire me. 
you see a design portfolio is a way to showcase what you're capable of doing in the hopes of impressing potential clients and getting them to want to work with you. Come on, let's face it. You may want to deny it, but deep down, we all know that we designers, we're a conceited bunch, aren't we? I mean, it's okay to say so. If we didn't think we were that good, we wouldn't be in this profession. I mean, nobody says, I don't think I'm a good designer, but I'm going to start a design business anyway. No, we're all doing this because we believe that we're good at what we do. And you know what? We like having people confirm that assumption. Why else would we showcase our work for everyone to see? And what better confirmation than having a client hire us after looking at our portfolio? I mean, we're no different than that proud peacock displaying all its plumage in the hopes of attracting a mate. We're just not attracting mates, we're attracting work. And that's it. Really, there's no other reason to have a portfolio. Now, do you need a portfolio in order to be successful? The short answer is no, you don't. I mean, I use myself as an example. My own business's website has been, quote unquote, coming soon for several years now. I haven't really needed the website because my business is doing very well. And during all that time, I have not had a visible portfolio for anybody to look at. And yet, I'm running a very busy and successful business, mostly through word of mouth referrals. In fact, during the past year, I can count on one hand the amount of times I was asked to provide a sample of my work before a client decided to hire me. Most of the time, I'm hired for a job without them ever seeing a sample of my portfolio. Now, could I attract more work with a visible portfolio? (laughs) I'm sure I could. But I just want to point out that a design portfolio is not the be-all and end-all of your marketing effort. It's a great tool to have, don't get me wrong. But it's only one of the many tools in your toolbox. So I just wanted to iterate that, yes, it's a good idea to have a design portfolio. And yes, you should have one. But it's not necessary. I'm case in point. For several years now, I have not had a portfolio online. And yet my business is still doing very well. But I'm here today to discuss building the perfect design portfolio, so that's what I want to get into. So what exactly goes into the perfect design portfolio? Well, I hear this question a lot, especially from newer designers just entering the field. In fact, that's kind of what Jason's question in the Facebook was. And you know what? It's a very valid question. I mean, even if a portfolio isn't a requirement to be successful, it sure does help to establish yourself, especially at the start of your career. And yes, it can attract clients. Now, whether you have a physical portfolio or a digital portfolio, and if you want my recommendation, you should actually have both. For when you meet somebody face-to-face, you don't want to say, go to my website and look. It'd be nice to actually have something to hand them and say, here's some samples of the work I've done. But regardless of how you present your portfolio, the content within should represent your best work. It's the culmination of your skills and your talent. But where does that work come from when you're new or if you don't have any clients yet? The answer is quite simple, actually. It comes from anywhere and everywhere that you can find it. Remember when I said that a portfolio is a way of saying, hey, look at me, see how great I am. You should hire me. That means that your design portfolio should contain things that showcase just how good you are. A portfolio shouldn't be, and I repeat, a portfolio should not be a showcase of Hey, look at who I've done work for. I mean, there's nothing wrong with name dropping, especially if they're well-known clients, but only providing the work is actually worth showcasing. Putting a name out there just to say, I've worked with this big wig client, but the work that you're showing is kind of average is actually going to hurt you in the long run. You see, what potential clients are looking for when they look at your portfolio is whether or not you have the ability to help them. They'll be able to judge that regardless if the samples you show are for real or for fictional companies. You see, the work within your design portfolio should display your diversity as a designer. It should demonstrate the skills you possess. It should show your knowledge of good layout, of color theory, of design technique, and everything that makes you who you are. It doesn't matter if the work you're showing was something you did for a client, something you made while you were in school, something you just did for fun for yourself, or something you designed specifically to go into your portfolio. As long as it demonstrates the skills and what you have to offer, it's good. And yes, 
you can showcase work you did while working for a previous employer. If you designed some great logos or some great posters or layouts while you were working for a design agency or something, you can display those in your portfolio because it is work you did. Now, make sure that you don't have some sort of agreement with them saying that you won't display that work or that you can't use that work because some places might make you sign that when you, you are hired on. But providing you don't have any of that, yes, by all means, use the work you created at a previous employer. Now, it's a good idea to say that you created this for another employer. In my case, there's a logo that I created. And this logo was created almost 20 years ago while I was working at the print company. But it's a logo that I'm very, very proud of. And it's a logo that is very recognized in my area here. It was for a charity, and that charity has grown over the years to something really big. So yes, whenever I do finally bring my portfolio back online, I plan on including that logo, even though I designed it 20 years ago, because one, as I said, I'm still happy with the way it looks, and people will recognize it. But I will be putting a disclaimer on that logo saying that I designed it while I was working at the printing company, but it's still my design. So showcase whatever you have whenever you have it. And as your career progresses and you design newer and better things, because with more practice, you will become a better designer, you simply replace the old pieces in your portfolio with newer ones. Or in some cases, age might not be what matters. You simply replace the previously good designs with your newer, great designs. It's that easy. Now, I want to warn you about going overboard with your portfolio. The best design portfolios I see are the ones that are actually sparse in what they show. When you build your portfolio, you should only be showing a handful of your best work in each category. Maybe it's logo design, maybe it's website design, maybe it's page layout, whatever it is, you should only be showing a few samples. You need to be confident in the few that you display and keep a few more that are not in your portfolio in case the client asks to see something else. I mean, the worst thing you can do, and I see this very often, is to show too many samples in your portfolio. Showing a few samples invites the viewer to admire what you have to offer. They look at the work, they see how well you did, and it entices them to want to hire you. Whereas when you show a large number of samples, what you're actually doing is inviting the viewer to critique and criticize your work. They see a dozen, two dozen logos in your portfolio. They're going to start looking through and seeing which ones they like best, but they're also going to look at and see which ones they can find flaws in or ones they don't like. And in doing so, they're actually looking at you a different way, which could in, make them look elsewhere. If they start looking at your portfolio and say, oh, I really like this one, really like this one, but oh, look at all these ones that I don't really like, then there's a chance that they might not hire you. So you could be shooting yourself in the foot by including more and more. Where if if you only have a couple of designs in there, if they see one they don't like, they might think, oh, well, you know, that's just, well, I'm not really crazy about that one, but these ones are really good. This is a good designer. So keep your sampling sparse. And if need be, the client will ask to see more work from you. And what's great about this is you can actually target the extra samples you provide them specifically for their needs. I mean, if a restaurant a new restaurant starting up is contacting you for design work and they look at your portfolio and you have a couple of logo designs for various companies. You have a couple of page layouts and that, and they say, this is really good stuff. We really like it. Do you have any other samples that you might be able to send us? Well, that's when you go through all your previous work and you say, well, you know, I designed a menu for such and such a restaurant, or I did this for the food industry. And you can pick and choose the stuff you're going to send them. I mean, there's no sense sending them a logo you designed for a plumber. If you've designed stuff for restaurants before, and you can send those to them. So keep your portfolio sparse and then keep some extras on hand that you can send out if need be. Now, before I end today's discussion, there is one more thing I want to talk about, and that's what to leave out of your design portfolio. And this is another thing that I've seen people, I've questioned them, and I just scratch my head. And it's simply don't display anything in your portfolio that you don't want to do. I mean, if you don't enjoy doing logos, then don't include logos in your portfolio. If you're not into web design, 
then don't display any websites you've created, even if they're really good websites. I mean, this should go without saying, but unfortunately, I see it all the time, especially with new designers, those that are, are fresh out of school and they put almost every school project on there because they don't have anything else to display. So they display all the work they did for school in their portfolio, regardless of whether it's something they want to do or not. Now, in some cases, they might take on work they don't want to do just because it's work. But at some point, you have to differentiate yourself from all that stuff and specialize, or, or not necessarily specialize, but just narrow down your focus. I mean, if you're an artist who likes to draw robots and science fiction scenes, don't include the cutesy teddy bear drawing your mother guilted you into doing for your cousin Millie's baby announcement. Because I guarantee you, if you do, you will almost certainly get that kind of work. That's the stuff that's going to be asked of you, not the robots and science fiction. You're going to be drawing teddy bears and unicorns and that, even though you have no passion to do so. So only include the stuff you really want to do. And it's okay to have a portfolio that only has a couple of items in it if that's the stuff you want to do. So that's today's topic. Basically, you can put anything you want in your portfolio, whether it was designed for a client, whether it was designed at school, whether it was designed for yourself, or something you specifically wanted to design for your portfolio. Maybe you don't have enough page layout designs, but page layout is something you're really into. Design some fake ones and put them in there. And yes, once you do get some under your belt, some, some real ones, you can replace the fake ones. Because your portfolio should be a fluid thing. It should be changing, evolving over time as you become a better designer. So what's in your portfolio? When was the last time you took a look at it? Could it use some updating? Have you designed anything that's really good lately that should be included? I want to take some time this week to just have a look at what's in your portfolio, especially if it's something you haven't looked at in a while. I mean, who knows? It might just help you land that next client that looks at it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 60 and leave me a comment there on your thoughts about your design portfolio. And now it's time for this week's question of the week. And this week's question comes in from Marcelo. And Marcelo asks, can I buy Adobe Photoshop outright? I want the Adobe software, but honestly, I'm in a bit of a loss with all the monthly payment options and extras that are offered. So what is the quote unquote common practice or what are most freelancers doing in general? At the moment, I'm using Photoshop, Illustrator and Premiere Pro, but I ideally would like to buy them all. As you know, we are continuously expanding and experimenting with new things as we never know what the future holds. Well, thank you for the question, Marcelo. And you asked what most designers are doing. Honestly, most designers have accepted their fate and have subscribed to the monthly Adobe Creative Cloud because that's the only way to get it. No, you cannot buy the newest version of Photoshop and Illustrator. You can't buy those softwares outright. They are all subscription-based, whether you buy them on a monthly basis or an annual basis. And what I don't like about Adobe is monthly or annually, you don't save anything. A lot of companies, when you buy the annual plan, you'll save a little bit of money over the monthly. But no, whatever you pay monthly is the exact same thing you pay annual, annually through Adobe. So you have no choice if you want those softwares. You, the newest version of those softwares, I should say, you have to get the subscriptions. Now, with that said, there is another way. And that is, you could actually go buy older versions of the Adobe software and use them at no extra cost. Because up until a certain point, you could buy them outright. And nowadays, going to buy, say, Adobe Creative Suite 5, you can go buy that and install it and never have to pay a, a subscription or anything like that. Yes, you would have to sacrifice some of the newer features that are available in the Creative Cloud version. But as I mentioned last week, when I was discussing stuff in the question of the week, a designer is a good designer should be able to design stuff regardless of the tools, whether you're using the newest version of Creative Cloud or you're using an old version of the software. The skill comes from within, not necessarily the tools. In fact, I just recently, I was on Adobe Creative Suite version 5. So I was using Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. And I didn't have Creative Cloud until I finally got Creative Cloud over the Christmas holidays. And the only reason I made the jump to Creative Cloud is because they had a super good discount for anybody who had never subscribed before, they had a super good discount if you bought like for the year. So 
I did that just to give it a try because um, I forget how much I saved, but it was a super big discount. So I purchased whatever, I subscribed for a year. I bought the year out, right? To give it a try. And in all honesty, yes, since then, I've been using the Creative Cloud version and I haven't really come across anything. I've seen stuff that's different, but I can't really say that there's anything super new or better that I didn't have in Creative Suite 5. I know there are some features, but personally, I haven't been able to find anything that I could honestly say, like if I was to lose Creative Cloud now and had to go back to CS5, it wouldn't be a big deal because there is nothing that I saw so far that is a game changer that I can say, oh, I can't live without that feature. There are some features in the, the, the Creative Cloud version that are very nice and I enjoy them, but I could live without them. So yes, you can go, if you look on eBay or, or elsewhere, you might be able to find some older versions of this software. And as I mentioned, it's the tools that you use. You are where the skill come from. So whether you're using Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, 2017 Creative Cloud, or if you're using an older version of the software, you, it's you that brings the skill. So yes, you can get some old ones, but if you want the newest version, you have no choice but getting the subscription. Now, Marcelo, I want to say one more option, and that is get away from Adobe altogether. There's a, a suite of software from Affinity, and you can uh, visit their website. It's affinity.serif.com, and they have two pieces of software, Affinity Designer, which is the equivalent of Adobe Illustrator, and Affinity Photo, which would be the equivalent of Adobe Photoshop. Now, what's great about these things is they're not subscription-based. You buy them outright, and they're not that expensive. In fact, I, I looked up, just because I was going to answer your question here, in Canada here, they're $69.69. So basically $70 Canadian. I didn't look to see what the American or the British or, or wherever else in the world, but they're $70 Canadian for each one of the software. And you get it, and then you never have to worry about monthly fees or all that. You can keep it. Yes, they come up with updates, and you'll have to pay for updates. But in the long run, it'd probably work out a lot cheaper. And it's available now for both Mac and Windows. Originally, it was just available for Mac. Now it's both Mac and Windows. Now, you did mention um, Adobe Premiere. That one there, I'm not sure about. Uh, I don't use it, so I don't know what the equivalent, but there's probably some sort of software that you can use. So yes, you can be a designer and not have to pay, or, or some people say, be a slave to Adobe and pay these monthly fees. And from what I hear, a lot of people that are using these Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo don't miss Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop. They say that they're very intuitive and they're, they're very similar. I know um, a couple of people that used to have Creative Cloud subscriptions that have now switched to the Affinity programs. Not all of them are graphic designers. Some of them were, were in other industries or other businesses, but did use the Adobe software. And now they've switched over to Affinity. And in all honesty, uh, it was looking like that would have been the route I would have gone on if I hadn't have got that super deal for the Adobe Creative Cloud. Because I, uh, I also, I don't use Adobe InDesign. I use Quark Express, which is something that I buy outright. Now it's a lot more expensive, but I just pay to upgrade it because I've been using it since whatever, the, the late 80s I've been using it. So because of that, the only Adobe software that I need is Illustrator and Photoshop. There are a few others that I've toyed with, but those were the two main ones. There is Adobe Audition, which is an audio program that's great for podcasting. Uh, and I did install that just to fool around with it, but I haven't made the jump on over to using it yet, which maybe one day I will. But for the, the next year, at least until next holiday season, I'm going to stick with Creative Cloud and just see how that goes. And then I'll decide whether or not it's worth paying the higher price because my super discount was only good for the first year. Afterwards, I'm going to have to pay the full price. And I'll decide at that point whether I'm going to stick with it or if I might make the switch to the Affinity software. I don't know. So I hope that answers your question, Marcelo. Yes, most designers, I'd say, I don't know a percentage, but I would guess that over 80% of designers out there are forking out the money for the Adobe Creative Cloud, whether they're doing it monthly or annually but it is not your final option. There are other, other options, either buying older versions of the software, which the drawback to that is someday there may come a time where your computer or they won't, won't be compatible anymore with the software or the hardware you have. But for now, you could do that. 
or you can find other alternatives like Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo. And for your Premiere Pro, there might be something else out there that you can use. So that's my answer, Marcelo. I hope it helped. And if anybody else has an answer for Mar Marcelo, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 60 and leave a comment on the show notes page if you have some other suggestions that he might be able to use instead of the Creative Cloud. Now, if you would like your question answered on a future episode of the podcast, and I'm once again running out of questions, so please, if you have something, send it in and I'll get to it as soon as possible. Simply visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit your question. Now, I received a great iTunes review I want to share with you. Before I get to it, I just want to remind you that iTunes reviews, a lot of podcasts say that iTunes reviews helps you be discovered in iTunes and other people discover you. That's not really the case. The reviews don't actually help the podcast be discovered. But what the reviews do is when a graphic designer looks up graphic design podcasts and they see a bunch of them show up in iTunes, reading the reviews could help them decide whether or not that's something they want to listen to. So if you want to help out a graphic designer by hopefully enticing them to listen to this podcast because you think it may be helpful, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes and leave a review. Not to mention that I read each and every one of them and it kind of gives me the warm and fuzzies whenever I read the great stuff that everybody's left for me, such as this one that came in from Melinda from Australia. And she wrote, Hi, Mark. Thank you for creating this podcast. I found you by chance and have been looking for a podcast like this one to propel me into starting my own design business. By listening to just a few of your episodes, a lot of the mystery that comes with working for yourself and in design has been cleared up. Never stop. And thank you again for helping me to understand better what it will take to achieve my goal. Melinda from Australia. So thank you for that kind review, Melinda. And you know something? With Melinda's reviews, I now have more reviews in Australia than I do in my native Canada. My most reviews come from the USA with now Australia in second place for the most reviews I've received. Now, I use a special software that sends me reviews regardless of where you are in the world. It doesn't matter what iTunes store you leave the review in. I've got this service called My Podcast Reviews that will email me every time somebody leaves a review. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you leave a review, I will get it and I'll read it. So thank you, Melinda, and thank you to everybody else who's left a review in iTunes for me. So that's it for this week's episode. I want to remind you of the resource tip that I shared at the beginning, which was a way to search Google for specific files and on specific sites by choosing, or by typing, I should say, by typing site colon and then the site name, and then file type, one word, colon, and then PDF. And that would allow you to search for PDF files on a certain website. And then you can download those PDFs and extract whatever vector files you need from them. So hopefully that's a tip that you can use. And I'll try to come up with some more to share with you in future episodes of the podcast. And once again, I want to thank Design Cuts for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you want to check out their latest deal bundle, or if you want to visit the design marketplace, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash design cuts. Using that link will let them know that you came to them from the podcast. And I would appreciate it. So that's it for this week's episode. I wish you all the best in your graphic design business. I am Mark DeCote, and as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.